to what extent would you go to show someone you love them? And when you think about the loved ones in your life, what kind of an act, what kind of a service, or to what extent would you go to demonstrate that love for them? I would argue that most people, if you're in this room, you're married, there was at least one moment in your life that you went and demonstrated and showed your spouse or your future spouse how much you love them. And that moment was when you proposed, right? That's what a proposal is. A proposal is one person deciding, okay, I love this other person and I'm going to demonstrate that through this moment in time where I'm gonna do something special. Some proposals are really grand, others are more simple and romantic. Some people I, I've talked to in like pre-marriage counseling have said, you know, I just, it was spontaneous. I was just, I, I loved them so much, I couldn't wait one more moment to tell them I wanted to spend the rest of my life with them. The proposal, an act of love. Now I remember when I, I determined that Caitlin was the one that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. I love her. She is the one God has for me. And I wanted that proposal to be a special moment between me and her. Now here's something about Caitlin. Uh, she is not the, she never wants to be the center of attention. All eyes on me, that's not her theme. She's a nurse, she's a servant, she likes to work behind the scenes. In fact, me just talking about this right now is probably uncomfortable for her. And unfortunately for her, there was one thing that was really big in our, nat in our nation uh, around the time that I was planning on proposing, and that one thing was a flash mobs. Y'all remember flash mobs? Flash mobs, you're, you're, you're out in public, you're shopping, you're doing something normal, and then all of a sudden some music starts. You're like, what's that? What's the music? Someone pops out, they start dancing to it, right? They've got some moves. You're like, this is weird. Random person dancing to random music. And then another person comes in, and they've got the steps right there along with them, right? Now we've got two random people dancing to random music, and then a whole mob of people in a flash come out with choreography, and they're all dancing to this song together. Flash mobs. Popular, popular. Back when I decided to propose. So when I was thinking to myself, what to do, what to do? And although Caitlin is more of a private person, I've always had uh, a tilt of theatrical in my life. <laughs> I knew that there was only one way that I could possibly propose, flash mob, <laughs> all right? And so for, I mean, for weeks, probably months leading up, I mean, planning happened. At this time, I worked at the Woodway campus still in uh, the children's ministry over there, so I had access to the jump and giggle teams. So boom, I've got 70 dancers at my disposal. <laughs> my, now we're talking. And so we, my mom and I, have made up some choreography, a few simple steps. We called this restaurant that had these nice gardens out in front. You know, we called them and said, can we use your sound system so we can play a song that will come on? The the plan was all in place. I'd contacted family members and friends, college roommates to come and, and, and pop up out of the bushes with signs saying like, true love, will you marry him, please? And then at that moment, they'd throw the sign and then they'd step in, right? I mean, everything was planned and coordinated. Why? Because I wanted more than anything to show Caitlin how much I love her. The day came, she thought that she was just going to dinner with my mom and my sister her and her mom for a little girl's nice night out. And then as she arrives to the restaurant, well, I pop out of nowhere. The music cues. We walk through the gardens. People are popping up out of bushes doing dance motions. <laughs> I mean, no one's expecting it. And then it all culminated to this front garden place where there was this gazebo where there was this pathway leading to it that we put rose petals on. I mean, actually, we've got a little clip. Just watch.
A little sneak peek. It's a little clip into our life. Notice after we propose, I'm like, woo! And she's like, there's like 80 people right there. <laughs> Why is everyone staring at me? The whole moment was planned. Why? Because I wanted to show her just how much I loved her. To what extent would you go to demonstrate your love to someone? Today, as we look in scripture, we're going to look at what I believe is undebatably the greatest act of love in all of history. We're gonna look at the most powerful moment on this planet Earth. We're gonna look at the most incredible act of love. Here's the sermon in a sentence. Here's our main point today. The greatest act of love in history is when Jesus died for you and me. Let's all say that together. The greatest act of love in history is when Jesus died for you and me. That's where we're gonna be today. Now I get that I'm talking to multiple groups of people in this room. Maybe you're here and you would say, well, you know, Jace, I'm not really a Jesus follower. You know, I'm here at church with a friend or with my family. I may, maybe you've been trying it out just a few times and you're like, yeah, I, I hear about Jesus and I kind of understand, I see that people really, really love him, but, but I'm not all in on that yet. I want you to know, first and foremost, you are welcome here. We are thankful that you're here. And I would give you this encouragement today. As we talk about this truth for the next few minutes, my encouragement would be lean in. Really take inventory of your life and think about these things that we're gonna speak of because I believe the simple message of the verse we're gonna look at could powerfully, radically change your life forever for the better. Listen closely. Now maybe you're here today and you would say, well, okay, I, I get that. That's a, that's a cute little phrase. I, I grew up in church. Yes, I, I learned at a young age that Jesus loves me, this I know for, the Bible tells me so. That's great, yes, I, I get that, I can check that box. Here would be my challenge to you today as we look at this verse and as we unpack this scripture. Don't let the things that we've heard our entire lives become repetitive or mundane. As we talk about these powerful truths today, my challenge would be, don't lose the awe, the wonder, and the majesty that is God's love. A powerful, powerful message, a powerful verse we have in God's word today. Now in the Bible, there are a few different types of love that you see mentioned. And we're gonna go fast, we're gonna go quickly through these, give a 30,000 foot view. The Bible, you see eros, and, and, and that's that romantic that, that sensual love that people have for one another. You see philia, this is that brotherly or that affectionate love that's in the Bible. This is a bond that you see in deep friendships, the bond that you would have with one another. Storge, that's that familial love, the love that maybe a parent would have for their children or the love that a brother might have for, for a sister. And these three loves can be interchangeable depending on what relationship's happening or what's going on. But there's another type of love that you hear in God's word that far outdoes every other love in God's word in the Bible, and that is agape. This is the unconditional love that God has for humanity. It's immeasurable, it's incomparable, it's perfect, it's unconditional, it's sacrificial. There is no earthly love that even begins to compare for the love that Almighty God has for earth, for the people, for humankind. Now before we even open up God's word today, let that sink in for a second. Because I think that's a very simple phrase that we hear repeated all the time. God loves you, right? We hear that. God loves you. Okay, that's great. God loves me. Really think about that statement that God 
almighty God who spoke the universe into existence. Massive, incredible, powerful God loves you. Teeny, tiny, little us in the grand scheme of life. God has unconditional, sacrificial love for you. That's an amazing thing. And we're gonna see today that he loves you so much that he demonstrates that love in the greatest act of love in all of history through his son, Jesus. Now, for the past few weeks, we have been in Romans chapter eight. We're looking at the goat, maybe the greatest chapter in, in all of the Bible or one of the greatest chapters in all of the Bible. So many powerful, incredible truths that we see in Romans chapter eight. And our assignment for today is simple. We're just gonna look at one verse. We're gonna look at Romans chapter eight, verse 32. So if you have your Bibles, you can open to Romans eight thirty-two, and that's what we're gonna look at. Romans eight thirty-two. it says this. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? When talking with Stephen before he left this week about this verse, he said, honestly, I thought about this verse for Easter. Really, it's, it's Easter 2.0. It's the greatest news, it's the greatest sacrifice, the greatest act of love of all time. It's something to celebrate. It's an incredible verse. So again, let's look at just the first half. We're gonna break it down to two parts. First half of 832 says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. God, who didn't spare his own son. Can you feel the weight in that? That again, God, the creator of everything, loved you so much, he sent his son to die for you, to take the punishment for your sins and mine. He did not spare him. He could have. But God, almighty God, chose not to spare his own son. He turned his eyes and he sacrificed him for you and for me. The most amazing gift, one of the persons of the Trinity delivered for us. That's what it says. Not only did he turn his eyes and, and, and he chose not to spare his own son. No, it takes it one step further. The verse says, he delivered him. For who? For you and for me. What a powerful, incredible act of love that God demonstrates for us all. God not only watches his son get killed for us, he delivers him. Here you go. I love them so much, I'm willing to deliver my son. Let that sink in for a second. That's a powerful thing. And looking at the scripture, there was one story in the Old Testament that I thought gave a, a little picture of the love that God has for us. And that is the story of Hosea. Do y'all remember Hosea? Hosea uh, was around probably around 750 years before Jesus comes. And Hosea is a prophet. Uh, what, what, what is a prophet? Prophets had an important role back in, in Old Testament times, what did they do? I heard it illustrated this way in this quick story, and I think it fits really well. In 1936, King Edward VIII was making a speech, and that speech was going to be transmitted through a single radio station in New York to America. So he's getting ready for this speech, and right before he starts speaking, someone in the radio station trips over the main power cord, splits it, and they lose the feed. So people are panicked in this moment. Uh-oh, we gotta get this word out to the people. And one person at the radio station, in a moment of quick thinking, picked up both sides of the cord and made the connection and, the, and, and restored the feed, literally because they were holding that power cord. So here's the picture. The king is speaking, and it's being transmitted literally through this person to the people. That's the picture of a prophet in the Old Testament. That's the role that they had. Almighty God would speak 
through these people to get his message out to his, to his children, to his people. That's what Hosea was. Hosea played a major role in God's ultimate plan. Now, prophets back in the Old Testament were all given different tasks. And I would dare say that Hosea receives one of the strangest, most peculiar, maybe difficult tasks of all of the prophets. God comes to Hosea and he says this. He says, Hosea, I want you to marry a woman knowing that she's going to cheat on him. She's going to commit adultery. I want you to marry her. What's this woman's name? It's Gomer. Unfortunate name. (laughs) Gotta be honest, when we had Ellie and we took inventory of names, Gomer wasn't on the list. Didn't make the list. Gomer, I want you to go marry Gomer. And so Hosea does that. He goes and he finds Gomer. He marries her. If your name is Gomer in this room, by the way, I am sorry. I can't imagine that it is, but I am sorry. Hosea goes, he marries Gomer, and at first, things are seemingly going pretty good. Their marriage is good. They have three kids. They have a boy, and then a girl, and then another boy, and and things seem to be all right. But then, tragedy strikes. One morning, Hosea wakes up. He's walking around his house, and, and Gomer's not there. Can you imagine that moment? He's searching for her. I shouldn't say she was gonna leave. He's checking the rooms of the house, possibly knocking on the neighbor's doors. Hey, have you seen Gomer? Have you seen her? Have you, have you seen my wife? And she's gone. She's left him. She's off living a life of sin, sleeping with other men, committing adultery. Here Hosea is, a single father, Alone, you can imagine hurting, devastated. I loved her. Why would she do this to me? It's difficult. As a prophet of God, he would have probably been a recognizable guy. Embarrassment was almost certain. Have y'all heard about what happened to Hosea? Yeah, his wife left him. It's a tough situation to be. But then, God gives Hosea a command, and maybe the most difficult command he could have imagined in that moment. God says this, this is Hosea chapter three, verse one. Then the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet is committing adultery, as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. God says, Go find Gomer, marry her again. Even though she's left you, even though she's with other men, even though she's committing adultery, he says, go find her, love her again. Even though you love her and she chose to do this, to run from you, go find her, marry her. And he, then he compares it to himself. He says the same way, I love my children, but they choose to worship other gods. They choose the world over me. Sounds eerily familiar to what we deal with today, doesn't it? Almighty God who loves his people so much, but yet they choose other things over him. So Hosea goes. Imagine that. Hosea certainly is going to places that a holy man normally isn't. Asking around, have you seen Gomer? I'm looking for Gomer. Yeah, we saw her. And eventually, he finds his wife. And most scholars believe that what Hosea walks up on is an auction. See, she's now in the slave industry. She's being sold into into sex slavery. And Hosea walks up on on this auction. Can you imagine that? I loved you, you left me, and now I'm here to find you, and and now I have to, I'm at an auction for my wife? She was already my wife, but now I stand here at an auction just trying to buy her back? And he does, he does. Verse two and three says this. 
So I purchased her for myself 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethage of barley, which is about five and a half bushels of barley. Then I said to her, you shall live with me for many days. You shall not play prostitute, nor shall you have another man. So I will also be toward you. Hosea comes up, pays the price for his wife, covers her, restores her, and loves her. That's just a little picture of how much God loves you and loves me. That even though she left him, she was living her own way, she turned her back on him, she's living in sin, he shows up and pays the price for her, loving her to restore her. Even though we, as humankind, turn our backs on God, live our own way, do our own thing, God loved us enough to pay the price to restore your soul and mine. The greatest act of love in history is when Jesus died for you and me. You know, there's a price for the sin in our life. It had to be paid. Romans 6 says this, for the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible teaches that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God because of the wrong things we've chosen to do in our life. Because we've chosen to try and run our lives, our sins have separated us from him. But God loved us enough unconditionally to send his son Jesus to die for you and to die for me. For the wages of sin is death. Jesus paid that price on the cross for your sins and for mine and rose again three days later. That's an incredible thing. The greatest act of love that we did not deserve. Look at what it says here in Romans 5. Romans 5, 6 through 8. It says, for while we were still helpless... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous person, though perhaps for the good person someone would even dare die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What an incredible passage. For a righteous man, someone might would give their life. For a good man, eh. Maybe, but who would die for, for sinners? Jesus. Jesus died for sinners, for you, for me, for the world. It's a powerful thing. It's the greatest act of love in history. And the verse continues to prove that. The second part of verse uh, Romans 8, 32 so he, did, who, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Now this is an argument from the greater to the lesser. The greatest thing ever was done when he chose to serve up his son for you and for me. That's the greatest act of love in history. So if he would do that, Providing all things, everything that we need, that's, that's nothing. That's minuscule in comparison to what he's already done. The verse itself is illustrating how incredible of a thing it is that God did for us. The greater to the lesser. It's like saying if God can speak and move a mountain, well then of course he could move a hill at a park. He's already done the most incredible thing. So of course, why wouldn't he do the next? Now, I do wanna say, you can read that verse and think, well, wait a second, what is that? Is that prosperity gospel? We're saying that if Jesus is the Lord of my life, then everything is gonna be mine. Like the car that I want will be mine, the house that I want, the spouse that I want. I'll never get sick. He'll just give me everything I want and need. Well, we know just from reading Romans chapter eight that that's not the case. When we learned in verses 20 to 25 that all of creation groans, that we as believers groan, there is sickness and death and decay. We'll learn in verses 35 and 36 in a few weeks 
that for the believer, there's persecution, there's pain, there's hunger, there's famine. So what this verse isn't saying is, if Jesus is your Lord, everything's gonna be all good forever. No, it's not saying that. But what it is saying is, all things is nothing in comparison to the, to the service and the sacrifice that God has already done by sending his son on the cross. And by the way, in Jesus, in a relationship with him, God has provided everything that we need. In Jesus Christ, you have all things. Scripture shows that. In Philippians chapter four, we see that we have the peace that surpasses all understanding. In 2 Corinthians chapter one, we see that through him we have comfort in hard times. In John chapter three, we see that eternity and everlasting life is there for those in Christ Jesus. And all through scripture, we see that we have a God that loves us unconditionally. We have all things. We have everything that we need in Jesus. That's an amazing thing, and I think that this whole passage, this whole verse, this whole message can truly be summed up in maybe the most popular verse in the Bible. John 3.16. What does John 3.16 say? Most of you memorized it as a child. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God loves the world. He loves you, he loves me, he loves everyone, so much so that he sent his son to deliver the greatest act of love in history, that Christ died for you and me. And if you would choose to believe in him, to put your faith in him. You are forgiven of your sin and eternal life waits you in heaven. Making Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life is the single most important thing you could ever do. Well, maybe you're here today and you're like, well, Jason, you don't understand. You don't know how far from God I am. I am Gomer. I have run from him. I am living actively in a way that I shouldn't be living. I'm living in sin. I want you to know this. God loves you. He sent his son for you. You are not too far gone. You can still be restored. You can still be saved and forgiven of all of the sin in your life. The greatest act of love in history is God sent Jesus to die for you few weeks ago, we were putting our children to sleep, and our kids are not very old. Our oldest child, Ellie, is five. She's almost six. So you never really know what's going to happen at bedtime. And while we're putting them to sleep, Caitlin from upstairs, I hear her yell, Jace, Jace, you're, you're going to want to come up here. Like, oh, man, what do we got? So I walk up the stairs. I walk into Ellie's room, and Caitlin says, tell your dad what you just told me. Here we go, here we go. She said, well, well Dad, uh, I was at church today. I'm like, okay, that's great. I was in Giggle, which is our preschool worship service. And I was like, that's wonderful. Tell me what you learned. And she said, and there was this boy. I was like, excuse me? I hope the boy you're talking about is the baby Jesus. She's like, no, there's this boy, and, uh, and dad, here's the thing. And I was like, what? And she looked at me and she said, I love him. <laughs> Five years old. And I was like, okay, let's, let's pump the brakes here for one second, all right, before we get too far. And then she took it further. She said, dad, I'm gonna kiss him. And I was like, you are not. Absolutely not. Not till you're 30 will you kiss a man or boy. Absolutely not. And we had this comical conversation in her little mind where there was this, you know, this boy that she liked so much as a five-year-old, which is a scary thought to what the future looks like. 
But I would go and giggle for the next few weeks and I would check and sure enough, every time she was in there standing next to the same boy, I'm like, there he is, I got my eyes on you. (laughs) Every single week. And I told some of the staff about that and, and they had shared that information. And a few weekends ago, I ended up talking to his mom. And, I, and, and she said, so I heard that Ellie has a little crush on my son. And I was like, yeah, yeah, she does. And she said, it's funny, I talked to him and I said, so in Giggle, uh, do you know a girl named Ellie? And he said, eh, maybe. <laughs> I think so. Huh. What a picture. Ellie's in there, I mean, thinking, I love this boy. I'm gonna kiss him. He's amazing. And this boy's in there just worshiping Jesus, right? He's not even looking at it. He has no idea she even exists. It's funny to think about that for our children. But here's my fear. All of us have the creator of the universe that loves us wants to be in a relationship with us, died for you and for me, loves us unconditionally, and how many of us don't even acknowledge that he exists? We don't even know that he's there. He wants you to know him. Forgiveness, restoration is there for those who make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life the greatest act in all of history. Jesus loved us enough to die for you.